hello, everybody. Um, my name is Rebecca Nellis, and I'm here at the Columbus Zoo, and I have Kim Horman with me as well today. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about virtual events, both uh, the IZE conference as well as some events that I've worked with here at the zoo, and uh, give you kind of a behind the scenes view of that. So I'm going to turn it over to Kim to tell us a little bit more about that. All right, thank you, Becky, so much for joining me today um, in this in this chat. So we're going to kind of give you a sneak peek. We've got a little um, little presentation. Is everyone seeing that? OK, there. Great. OK, so we obviously do biennial conferences uh, with IZE. So every other year and we were so excited to be in San Diego this year for the 2020 conference. And then, of course, the theme COVID hit, and we were really hoping to keep it in person, and we, it just was not looking good. And so then we really started considering what does this look like um, as a virtual conference potentially. And so there were definitely some benefits that we could see. Um, you know, it was accessible to more people by having a virtual conference. There weren't the travel restrictions. It was cheaper. It was less expensive because you didn't have to buy plane tickets or hotel accommodations. There was also the benefit of we could record the sessions and broadcast them. They're coming soon if you attended, don't worry. Um, but there were definitely some general opportunities and challenges. So thinking about the platform, you know, how, how are we going to broadcast? We knew there was no one perfect answer. Um, time zones, you know, we're all over the world. Um, and then the timing of things, our in-person conferences are typically four days. And we felt that doing a virtual conference really needed to be condensed down. So not only time zones, but the timing of things. We also recognize that a virtual conference, like everything right now, is internet dependent. Um, we know that, you know, some places have maybe rolling blackouts for some conservation of energy or some places just don't have coverage. So we didn't want to exclude anyone. Uh, and so it was definitely something we were aware of, but weren't really sure how to overcome. And then we were also very cognizant or aware of the interaction piece. Um, you know, one of the greatest things that I love about going to conferences with my zoo and aquarium colleagues is touring a new place. I love seeing their space and maybe getting to go behind the scenes and um, just getting to have that experience as well as just those social interactions, you know, seeing someone at breakfast or having coffee after a conference. So how do we try to maintain as much of that as possible? So really thinking about IZE specifically too, we had to think about registration. How were we going to have people register? What was our cost going to be for the conference? Who was going to manage that? Uh, luckily, Nettie Pletcher, who is our IZE administrator. <laughs> Sorry, I have, a, I have a first grader doing virtual school in here with me. <laughs> um, but we have Nettie who gets who does a great job managing our wild apricot membership database and management system. So that was already in place and so easy to do. One of the big things though that we knew moving to a virtual conference was we needed to do presenter test sessions. So we wanted everyone to have the opportunity to be familiar with the Zoom platform, which was the ultimate choice that we went with. Um, basically because San Diego Zoo was our host and that's what they had available to us. <laughs> um, so we did offer four test sessions for presenters. I to play it. And I think we had almost all presenters, maybe only four or five didn't make it to a test session, which was really impressive. I will say a lesson we learned though, was if you're going to do a conference and have those presenter test sessions to have your presenters try to test from the same location that they will actually be presenting at. And I'll give the example of we had someone who had a beautiful test session, was able to connect very easily, very clear audio and video, but between the test session and the actual presentation, the presenter moved and to a new house. And so, then the day of the presentation, the connection was not as good. So that was something that we did not specify of testing from where you're presenting from. So I think that was a lesson learned. 
We also had the schedule planning piece uh, because it was going virtual. We could have more presenters present from their time zone. Um, but Dr. Jim Marshall, he did a great job managing that. I'm sure it was a scheduling, <laughs> uh, scheduling kind of challenge, but he did great. But because of that, we were able to be more inclusive, but it also meant that we were going 48 hours straight. And as part of that, we also needed to plan for passing the host and the tech support. We couldn't ask our San Diego zoo guy to stay awake for 48 hours. Um, so not only did we have presenter test sessions, but we had tech support test sessions to make sure we could like pass host back and forth. And could we do breakout rooms and stuff like that. So definitely a challenge, but also planning to make sure we knew who the next host was on the schedule as we were moving through the time zones. And then in addition to the registration platform, also thinking about what was the session management. So we decided we were gonna use Zoom for the sessions, Wild Apricot for registration, but how are we going to do the course catalog for the sessions, the conference itself, pardon me. And again, San Diego Zoo came in, they have their San Diego Zoo Global uh, course catalog, which is a benefit for IZE members to access. And so we were able to use that to be able to post the sessions and do the bios for the speakers. And that was just so wonderful that we had that ability. So there's some behind the scenes planning. We did get some data um, that I wanted to share with you from the conference. Um, so first one was just kind of who was there. Um, you can see here the majority were zoo educators, um, then aquarium educators, but we also had people from nature centers, um, park educators, consultants. We did have some people in the academic or research realm. And then other were things like students that were, were part of our conference. So pretty good, good cross section there. This was the part I thought was really interesting. We asked how many IZE conferences you've attended and you can see the large majority, over 70%, this was their first conference. And I, I do think it was because it was virtual. We kind of pulled that out of some of those open-ended questions that they were able to attend an IZE conference because they did not have to travel. So from that accessibility piece, that was just really, really, really wonderful just to kind of get a cross section of what region our attendees were in. Um, the majority were from North America. We had a great turnout from Europe and Middle East and Oceania, Oceania I can't say that word ever, <laughs> um, and Africa. And just, we had representation from everywhere and that's just so wonderful to have that. So then from our open-ended questions, I kind of pulled out what people felt was the best part of attending this conference and what was the worst part of attending this conference. And I want to make very clear here that this was me very quickly looking at the responses and assimilating in my brain what the most common responses were. These, these have not been coded and looked at by an evaluator, so please just be cognizant of that. But I definitely saw a lot of people saying that connecting with educators all over the world was one of the best things. Of course, we always love to meet with our colleagues. Uh, the breakout rooms where we were able to have more of those social interactions. And then people did comment that by having a virtual conference, it meant that they could attend, that they were able to attend the conference. Uh, and a couple other people commented things like, oh, I could do this from my living room, or it was nice to be able to do laundry and not travel. So <laughs> I think not traveling was a little bit of a benefit. But there was definitely some challenges. Um, so the worst part was they missed sessions because we did go 48 hours straight and people do need to sleep. Um, except for Hero, our Southeast Asia rep. I don't think he slept at all. <laughs> so big hand to Hero. <laughs> um, <laughs> But people did comment that they missed sessions due to time zones. And so maybe not having 48 hours straight. And that came out into saying, you know, the back-to-back -back sessions, it was just a little too much. Um, so just maybe breaking it up a little bit more. And people did comment that they, they missed exploring a new place or having those social interactions of just, 
you know, between a session, you get together and grab a coffee and talk. So definitely some opportunity there. Um, but overall, I think it was really well received. We had a wonderful turnout. And so that is from IZE. And now Becky is going to talk about her experience with some other virtual conferences. And then we'd like to open this up and just get questions from you, hear about any experiences that you've had. So Becky, take it away. Oh, oh. sorry. I had one more <laughs> slide, apparently. <laughs> Um, I just put this data in yesterday because we just got the evaluation results, but I thought this was interesting too, is we asked how likely you're to attend a, vir a virtual versus an in-person future IZE conference, and you can definitely see the numbers there that will more likely to attend a virtual conference, so there's definitely pros and cons. And now it's Becky's turn. My apologies. It's all right. No, so um, so we had this experience with IZE. I also was fortunate enough to be part of our um, AZA conference here um, in the U.S. Was also became virtual due to COVID. And so um, the Columbus Zoo was supposed to host in person this year. Um, sadly, we weren't able to do that. So um, AZA took the majority of the conference. But what they did ask the zoo to do was present for a virtual zoo day. So, um, you know, we kind of went around and around with this idea of how do you um, share your facility with people virtually? Um, and, and we wanted to make sure that it was going to be interesting for people, that they're going to have an opportunity to be able to uh, really see kind of um, all of the special things about, about our facility. And so, and the path that we chose to take was we pre-recorded some pieces. So we pre-recorded an introduction uh, from our zoo CEO, Tom Stolf, uh, which really focused a lot on community. Um, we, we talked about how important uh, our, our fellow zoo and aquariums are to us, as well as our community here in Columbus, um, and, and really emphasized how this place could provide people with a safe, a safe place and special thing to do with their families uh, it, during this time of COVID. And so he did that introduction. Um, and then we looked at what pieces we would really want to highlight throughout the zoo and share over video. And so we went through, we had a new region that had opened here at the zoo. We pre-recorded that. And then we would do live question and answer between each of the segments of video. So we showed our new region. And then this photograph is a picture from, from that live piece. So we would have someone from that region there to respond to questions that were coming in live um, during each of those, those segments. Um, we did have some preceded questions just to kind of get the ball rolling, but we wanted people to be able to ask us questions and, and get that feedback um, right in real time. So we went through, we did the, the newest region, but then we also highlighted lots of other spaces here at the zoo that you might not necessarily even get to see if you were visiting. So we incorporated behind the scenes pieces. We talked a lot about our conservation work, which was an opportunity that, um, that we might not have had if people had been here in person. I think when you uh, do go to see a new facility, you might not necessarily get all of those pieces of information. And so it gave us an opportunity to highlight some of those. We also highlighted our new education facility here at the zoo. Um, we had just built a new classroom building, so we were able to showcase that and um, talk about some of the new accessibility initiatives we have. Um, so, so it gave us an opportunity to really be thoughtful about what people experienced at our zoo, um, which was a definite opportunity um, that we took advantage of here uh, when we were doing the virtual zoo day. In addition to that experience, we currently are planning our Teen Eco Summit. Um, so this is an event that has happened in person here at the zoo for the past three years. This will be our fourth annual summit. Um, and we're going to be doing that in January. And so um, this event had, had some additional challenges. We, in the past, had a full-time person that was dedicated strictly to planning this event. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we, we had to reduce our staff by about 50% this summer. And so that position was eliminated. So the remaining people who are here uh, had to really think about not only how are we going to continue that Teen Eco Summit, but how are we going to do it in a completely new and different way? Um, also facing the challenge that schools cannot come to the zoo right now on field trips. Um, here in, in Columbus, uh, none of our schools are participating in field trips at all. So, so we knew virtual was going to be the way to do that. We reached out to people who had participated in the past and we asked them whether they thought it would be better to have kids sign up individually 
or continue to do school teams as we had in the past. Um, we kind of thought the schools might want, want to um, not, not deal with it this year, that they might say, you know what, we're gonna let those teens just take care of this on their own. But we actually saw the exact opposite. We had teachers come to us and say, we want to participate in this again, and we want you to facilitate um, us being able to work together as a school, even though we may not all be in the same place. So how we decided to approach this was to do a single day event. It's going to run from nine o'clock to three o'clock on that day on January 13th. And we're going to um, use speakers more for inspiration um, and then do ask schools to do kind of the real work, hard work of the summit after the fact. So, so in a typical year when we're all in person, we do a lot of um, having them brainstorm what projects they're going to work on in their school. We have them really think about, okay, what, what is going to be our path to success? success. This year, we're, we're really more focused on how do we get kids to think about how they can make a difference in a much bigger scale. Uh, so we are going to kick off that, that summit with um, an inspiring speaker. We're having someone come in from Polar Bears International to talk about how polar bears are affected by climate change. And then we're pulling in other speakers from all over the world who are able to talk about really actions that, that kids can do here in Columbus, Ohio, that are going to impact wildlife all around the world. Um, so that's something we wouldn't normally be able to do in person. In person, um, we might have, have a couple of keynote speakers, but we wouldn't be able to have really this range of people participate in the event. Once we get done with that kickoff event, then we decided we wanted to try to really increase our continued engagement. So in the past, the summit is an amazing thing. Kids come here, they're here for two days, we have an amazing time, and then we kind of send them off out into the world and we hope that they go and, and do great things. Um, they follow up with us with a report a couple of months later, but that's really the extent of that engagement. This year, because we're able to do it virtually, it opened up all sorts of opportunities for us to think about how we could continue that engagement in a better way. So what we're going to do is we're going to have follow-up webinars that are about specific topics that we know are interesting to our schools for these different pieces of, um, of programs. So um, for example, we know in the past we've had lots of kids who are interested in creating school gardens. So we're going to offer a webinar series specifically about school gardens that really gets into the nuts and bolts of how can you do that in your school environment so that those schools who want that topic can then participate in those webinars and continue with that engagement. We also are looking at ways that we might be able to use different discussion platforms, things like Slack, or, um, or we have a, a system here called Remind that allows people to be able to send out text reminders. We're looking at ways we can utilize some of those tools to be able to continue to get those teens to engage with us. Um, the other thing that we feel is really, really important is creating a space for teenagers to have some fun and to be able to collaborate with one another. Because I think that's what we're all missing right now in this virtual world, right? Is, is you know, I think, um, you know, my own children who are 12 and 14 years old are, are missing their friends. You know, they, they can go on and they can do webinars about content, but they don't often have, have chances to just be silly and, and have a good time in this format. So um, we also are looking at ways that we can maybe do just some fun events to get kids talking with one another. So we're looking to host things like a trivia night potentially, or or um, an art DIY night where they can create things like t-shirt bags from reusable materials. Um, but, but more importantly, giving them a space where they can meet with like-minded teens and share their conservation ideas to get people excited about it. So, um, so I think, again, just like, like everything people have been saying with all of these events, there are a lot of opportunities that might not be there if it wasn't virtual. I am so looking forward to being able to see these kids in person again, but I think that we will probably take some of the lessons we've learned from this year and apply those to the future and think about how we could maybe do a blend of having that in-person connection, but still being able to continue that engagement virtually after these events are over. So I would love to hear more about kind of what, um, what you're thinking and what you're all doing out there. But before I do that, I wanna take a moment to be able to get a picture of all of us together. And so I'm hoping that you will, will indulge me a little here and turn on your cameras. And I'm going to try to get a good picture of all of us together um, for us to be able to share as we're celebrating our, um, our day today with, with ICE. All right, Kim. Do you know, I am having a hard time getting up the gallery view to see everybody. Are you able to see that on your screen? Yeah, do you want me to, to take a quick picture? Yeah, can you do the picture? That would be awesome. Sure. All right, so when everyone's ready, 
nope, I hit the wrong button. Hold on. Okay, everyone, <laughs> give your smiles a break. Hold on. <laughs> All right. One, two, three. All right, I think that's it. Let me check it. I think my computer is tired today. <laughs> I got it. We're good. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So does anybody have um, maybe some, some other um, things that they'd like to share about virtual events like conferences or, or you know, big, big events like this, or, or maybe has questions for Kim or I about how we've, how we've done these types of events? Becky, I don't know if you saw in the chat, Susan um, did ask if there's a cost to join the Eco Summit. No, so the Eco Summit is actually a free event. And, um, and if anyone is interested in participating or just wants to see what it's all about, um, if you visit the Columbus Zoo website, which is just columbuszoo.org, um, you can find the Teen Eco Summit on there and just, and, and just fill out the form and tell me that, that you wanna participate or that you wanna observe. Um, we'd be happy to send you the information to be a part of that. But it is a free program for, for teenagers to participate in. A quiet group today. <laughs> okay, so instead of typing a long question, I'll just make a suggestion. We've got the most incredible resources that we're seeing from around the world. Imagine if we could put together some sort of a, a resource directory that says this is what's available. So the best aquarium programs, these are 10 facilities that are doing them. If you want polar bears, these are the places that have got incredible polar bear ideas and works. I mean, there's just, as we've been through the conference and we've been through today, we've just seen how much incredible stuff there is. And I don't have to live in Dublin if I want to see some amazing programs from, from Dublin Zoo or go to Italy or, experience Becky's program. I mean, there is such good stuff there. Let's, I'm not creating jobs for anyone, but maybe we can just think about how to, to put it into a directory that we could share because I'd love to be able to say, oh, I'm really struggling with this. Where do I find it? We could look at the directory and find what's happening. And the ideas for, for virtual conferences, I think are, are great because we're going to need them in the future. So yeah. thank you both. I totally yeah, so, agree, Judy. And, yeah. and, you know, and I will um, add on to that idea a little bit that I think there would be a huge benefit in um, potentially posting speakers. Um, you know, I know, so like right now, for example, I'm trying to find um, a teenager who can talk about um, how they've really done something that has, has changed the world, you know, that's made, made a huge impact. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to go in and see some kind of, um, of snippets of, you know, here are different speakers that we've had speak at things um, that might be interested in speaking at your event as well. Um, I think I think as people are looking at these virtual opportunities, it does, it opens the whole world up to you. I mean, you, you could get a really cool speaker from, I don't know, any, anywhere else in the world. Yes. It doesn't be American. And that's and that's really amazing. So yeah, yeah I think I think that the, the space is changing. But I think what you said was also quite useful is that we are going to learn to do a blend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, We've learned lessons from this for, for future. And I think that's, you know, when I talk to my team about it, that's one of the things that I think has kind of kept us going, truthfully, is the thought that the things that we're creating now could, could be useful in the future, that it doesn't have to just stop when COVID goes away. And so I think that that's something that has really impressed me with all of the pieces that I've seen people put together is, um, you know, it, this this challenge has brought about a lot of innovation and, and I'm excited to see where that that allows us to go in the future. I think there's a lot of potential too for partnerships. I just think of um, myself, I'm in the middle of the United States at the St. Louis Zoo and we are a zoo. So how great would it be, I'm gonna put Judy on the spot to say, hey, we wanna learn about some marine ecosystems in South Africa. And then we connect with students or educators there as well. And we, we really leverage those partnerships to truly explore the world. So I think that's something in this virtual realm that I haven't seen a lot of yet, but I think is coming as we all kind of wrap our brain around it more, you know, we, we've all been kind of um, scrambling and treading water and now we're starting to swim a little bit more. So I think as we're exploring that, we're going to see more of these really interesting and intriguing opportunities that 
you know, maybe we hadn't thought about before, but it, it does exist in this virtual realm. Yes, uh, so um, I have an experience for several years now, I don't know, uh, six, seven years now, uh, with, we partner with Microsoft Education. Uh, yeah, six, seven years, uh, because they have uh, um, an amazing uh, program that is a Skype in the classroom. Have you heard it? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's all around the world. We have three, um, three educational programs there. Uh, one for kindergarten, one for kids from uh, six, uh, yeah, yeah, eight to ten, and uh, other for teenagers, a, 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 a bit older. And it's a big success. We had to restrict even the, 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 the applications, the registrations for one or two or twice a week and, and with uh, uh, restrict schedules, you know, because we keep having a uh, uh, applications for all over the world. And uh, it's really, really fantastic. That's why we, well, we run so fast the, the um, uh, all the online programs now because we had the, that experience before uh, and we so it was easier for us <laughs> because of that but uh, they are they run this and it's really because and the, they have more than uh, I don't know how much uh, how uh, now but uh, at the time uh, the last time I saw it six 600,000 teachers around the world. Uh, you can imagine, it's, it's really great. Yeah, so uh, here's the <laughs> this tip. Skype in the classroom, search it. <laughs> Stephen, I, I see your question about, has anyone done cross-cultural and cross-language virtual conferences. I am conscious as an English speaker, I'm very lucky everything is in English, but perhaps we are missing some of the opportunities and bringing people to get people around the world together in other ways. And I think that that is a great question. It's definitely something that I know I've been thinking about. Um, I just learned that Zoom has what's called SI or simultaneous interpretation in certain languages. And I'm, I'm looking into that more um, to figure out what exactly that entails. I do know my experience is primarily with Zoom. So I invite anyone who knows otherwise. I do also know with Zoom, you can live close caption. Um, one of my educators, who I think is actually here, Tiffany, are you still on this call, Tiffany Evans? Yes, I am. Um, hi, Tiffany did some great webinars with American Sign Language, and we actually hired someone to close caption that. So not only were they hearing Tiffany and seeing her sign language, but we also had a closed captioner that was captioning what she was saying. Uh, we learned the hard way, though that does not translate to the Zoom recording. So that was an interesting lesson learned. <laughs> um, I also know with pinning videos, I don't know if anyone has tried pinning certain videos. So basically on the user side of Zoom, you can choose to pin certain videos so that they don't move around as people join and leave the conference. So you could have someone, like I could be speaking now and if we had a sign language translator, the person, the receiver could pin the translator so that they could always see that person no matter what. So there's definitely some opportunity, but I also think culturally there's some opportunity as well. So um, it's a great, great question and definitely an opportunity in this virtual realm. So I invite others to, to share their experiences as well. And I believe, am I right, um, Kim, that, that this afternoon, or that in a couple of hours, that there is going to be sessions that are in Spanish, correct? Yes. So the um, speakers from our IZE conference, which was in English, they will be presenting their IZE presentations, I believe, primarily in Spanish, and there will be one that will be in Portuguese. So, because we, we heard from them that that was also important, that they wanted to be able to speak um, in their own language as well to do those presentations. And so I think it, it is, it's, an, it's another great opportunity to be able to think about how can you blend those things in this type of format. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions or ideas they want to share? Yeah. 
here, I think AI would be be great. My my secret hope is that someday we'll get to holograms. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. That's true. That's that's true. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but uh, uh AI uh, technique is a uh, uh, more uh, more better more more promoting a uh, uh, higher and higher so we can uh contact each other uh more better no, for mm -hmm. understanding each other yeah yeah mm -hmm. i believe <laughs> i do believe <laughs> yes thank you kim so a question i've got for for all of us is one of our key foundations of what we do is inspiring learning and caring through reality that's what we say makes us different to Net Geo and all the rest of it. And now we can't do that. What are the techniques to, to give that care and to give that inspiration virtually? So what, what are we finding works? Um, just, yeah, any, any ideas and suggestions? So, um, so we have uh, here in Columbus, a, a woman who works on my team who um, teaches our preschool programs. And I think that for her, so it's, it's children that are three to five years old. And for her switching to a virtual platform was, was challenging because she's used to having those, those little ones in a room with her, right? And being able to, um, to really speak with them, engage them that way. Um, she has worked very, very hard to find ways that she can still reach out to those kids. And, and one of the things, one of our most exciting successes was when um, we had a child who didn't want to disconnect from her on the computer because they were so happy to see her and talk with her. And I, so, so I think for, for a lot of people, it is how do you make it feel like I'm in the same room with you? Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about this isn't going to be like TV. It's not. It's not going to be a totally polished piece with um, no stumbling and no mistakes. But that's what also makes it feel real and and authentic. And so, um, so we try to do a lot of um, how can we figure out this activity or this way to engage kids and, and make it feel like they're in the same room with me. So, you know, we might do a sing-along, you know, if with, with little kids that, that, you know, we would normally do in person with the older kids. Um, I think, I think we saw with the results with the IZ conference, the, the, the breakout rooms are very, very successful because it gives people an opportunity to have those authentic conversations that they would have in person. Um, and there's, there's just something different about being able to talk with one another and see one another um, and, and have that kind of interaction that I think that I think some of that is it makes it makes it feel more um, it, it, different than, than TV you know I always encourage a live interaction versus versus a, a pre-recorded video for for that piece you know I'll, I'll jump in here too and say that um, at the St. Louis Zoo we've been doing distance learning and virtual programs since 2008 so we were very lucky to have that experience but we've definitely had to um, challenge ourselves in this new realm um, for a lot of reasons, but one of our big ones is that we've lost our access to our animal ambassadors um, through a zoo decision. And so we're really creatively thinking about how do we use our zoo grounds and the animals there. This is another good thing that's come out of COVID is that our crowds are smaller. So we're able to show animals live from their habitat. And Tiffany, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Um, Tiffany actually created virtual field trips that we've been offering that teachers can book. And it's like an authentic trip to the zoo. And Tiffany, can you share some of the comments you've gotten from students as we've been doing these field trips? Definitely. Um, yeah, we've gotten really positive feedback so far. And, and kind of like Becky, like you said, it's, it's really making it personal. Um, we have one that's based off of their mascot and their mascot was bears. And so I, you know, I looked up the school and I looked up their motto and their bears and we connected it. And so as soon as they logged on, it said, welcome Wilkie bears. And we made kind of those connections and we did a song with them. And then we were live at our bears at the zoo. Um, so making those connections and getting to kind of interact with them in any way possible. Um, but yeah, we've had all we've pretty much done all ages. We actually on Monday or Tuesday this week, I did one for adults and it was a company in St. Louis and it was over 50 adults. And some of the ones on that, even they were like best day ever. This was so much fun. You know, it was a totally different experience for their work day. Um, so we've gotten a lot of feedback. A lot of the kids have really enjoyed it. 
And, um, you know, depending on the size of the group, if the group is really large, we'll have to do it webinar style where we cannot see them. But for the most part, we can, it says a meeting like this and we can see them. And it helps us as educators too, because it's really hard to teach to people you can't see, <laughs> you know, and we've had to do it. But when you can see them and you can see their smiling faces, oh my gosh, it just like, oh, I love it so much. So it's, it's, you can see the feedback right there and you can see them enjoying the program and see their faces just light up. Um, and they can feel like they're at the zoo um, with the virtual field trip. I just want to jump in on that as well, because we were literally just talking about engagement because we did a lot of just teaching to the screen at the start of um, the COVID pandemic. And our Halloween virtual workshops were, we were quite nervous about them because we'd never done this, this format where we could see 20 screens. And we started with 20 kids. We had 68 year old program and a, a nine to 12 year old, year old program. We started with six across the week and they sold out and then we went to we did an extra uh, sessions in the afternoon so we had nine across the week and we learned as we went but it's we actually have now a list of engagement tools of all the strategies we use to try and get as many voices back not necessarily voices i should say but to get as many um physical engagement so if it's like acting out act like the animal or it could be we put up three so answer you know three um images behind us with a one two and three so put up your fingers as a one two and three and we've learned literally in the last, of, I'd say, three weeks of as many different types of engagement tools in the virtual world. And we were literally just in the background here having a conversation about whether we would go to do some of this outreach activity. Would we do it face to face or should we actually keep a lot of it virtual because we can engage with more people? Um, so we're, we're at the moment compiling a kind of a, a department best practice in virtual learning um, uh, package just to remind ourselves and when hopefully in the future we have to train more educators that we can bring back into our team uh, um, how to do it but I think um, yeah I think there's a lot of things that can be done really really well and I think if you're smart around how to use zoom or whatever um, whatever uh, tool you're using that there's even the chat function um, is so useful and actually our moderator is the key person because the moderator will prompt the educator to say you know, oh, maybe ask Mary a question there. We haven't heard her voice in the room yet. Um, and yeah, we've come up with, we've learned so much. It's, it's quite incredible. And, and I think you have an excellent point. I, um, I, I think having somebody who is there to support the person who's doing the presentation is huge. Um, when we've done uh, any of these events, you know, that it, you might have noticed that picture of us doing the virtual zoo day. You know, there was a ton of people in that room. There's one person who's on camera, but there were a ton of people <laughs> there to provide to provide support. But um, but usually we have one person who's kind of, you know, moderating, doing the behind the scenes tech work and one person who's teaching so they can really focus on those interactions. I think that's a huge, really important piece. Yeah. Big time. I'm seeing quite a lot of ideas here in terms of the our virtual virtual engagement toolkit. It would be so nice if we could capture these ideas. How do you ask questions? All of those kind of things that we look at. Uh, I think we're definitely on a job creation thing here. So the next thing on our list of things to do will be the the virtual the virtual engagement toolkit because I think it would help all of us because we're all we're all struggling and we've got so many good good ideas out there. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, and again, moving forward, I think people are going to continue to do this in some capacity. So having having those tools would be would be incredibly helpful. Yeah, I, I know for us, we're planning on 2021 to stay full virtual. Um, we're hoping that it won't happen. But um, we just feel that that's probably going to be the case, at least for us. Again, I'm in the middle of the United States, but we are doing another teacher survey in January. We did do one in August as school was starting. We're going to do another one in January um, to figure out what the teachers need and what they're they're thinking and feeling and hoping for. Um, but we feel that even if schools are able to come to our zoo or we're able to go to them again, that we're, we're just going to see an uptick in our virtual programs because now teachers are aware it's an option too. You know, I, th I think in the past that maybe they weren't aware necessarily that they could do this or, you know, these adult companies that were just a break in their day, they now know that we're a resource for them. So um, I, I think that that's going to be a thing and having these toolkits and so Judy we will get a transcript of the chat box as part of the recording of this so we are capturing all of those ideas so 
Um, if you have a thought and you, you don't want to turn on your camera or your microphone, feel free to drop it in the chat so we can make sure that we, we capture your, your contributions, of course, to, to whatever this toolkit might be. I guess I'll jump in quickly and say these are, and I think Antonietta will agree that these are definitely discussions that we've been having kind of at an EASA level as well about toolkits. So I definitely think that uh, we can probably, I'm sure, spread the workload around um, and hopefully get something that's useful for everybody. And also on the kind of the virtual database of activities and content that people have created, I think we're probably part way there with that. And um, I know we have not fully comprehensive, but definitely we've had people coming up with uh, and sending in their activities for EASA. So we've started compiling that based on the different language and we stole the, sorry, we borrowed the idea from AZA. So <laughs> I'm sure that um, there's still that that list as well. So I think there, there's probably already a good start on getting that content uh, available for everybody. Thanks. I'm happy to share we'll, once we get our, our document, I have it in front of me as a draft. So yeah, happy to share what we've learned. Yeah. And I guess I'd say another thing I'm kind of curious about is I see someone just mentioned Padlet in, in the chat there, just to see like what other tools are people integrating into using Zoom or Teams or, or whatever they're using. Um, so now we've been experimenting with maybe using Kahoot for some of our training events. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious to know if there are other kind of apps that people are bringing in and anything that works well or doesn't work. I know in a session this morning um, with David, our representative from Africa, Canva was mentioned. Um, Judy, is that the correct name? Do you? Um... Yes, it's Canva, it's Canva, yeah. Yeah, this is a powerful, it's a tool uh, that you can use photos, create your own PowerPoints very, and it, it's very good. I, I used to, to use it. Yeah. There's a free trial and there's um, a part of that that is free. And if you want to explore more, it's paid, but uh, it, it's a powerful tool, yeah. I believe someone mentioned in the chat earlier, though, that if you're a nonprofit organization, you can access, you can get oh, access to the Pro do, Tools I for free. Um, yeah, that, that was that was me. Um, okay. but oh. we, we set it up a few years ago. But yeah, our funding coordinator did manage to get a, a free Pro subscription for us. Mm -hmm. So you get 10, 10 accounts um, as part of your team. And then you have access to some of the paid features. I mean, some things are just premium content that you have to pay for unless you have like the real kind of super premium subscription, but it does give you access to most of the features and photos for free. Yeah. Um, well, but basically uh, it's uh, free templates, uh, free templates that you, you can, you can move and pick up pictures and uh, it's all organized. It, it's very good. Yeah. And creative. <laughs> That's good. Any any other tools that anyone has used? I would love to hear more about Padlet. I, I have have my my kids have used it with school, but I haven't had a chance to really investigate that. If somebody had more information about that, I've I actually used it for a conference that I did in 2019. <laughs> you know, back in those days. Yeah. <laughs> And it, it was interesting because it was an in-person conference when we could still do that, but we set up various Padlets with prompts. It was for teachers. It was a teacher development. And um, it was interesting because they could respond in the moment. They could choose to be anonymous and, but it also kept it going. So they had access. It's kind of like a digital um, cork board or um, bulletin board that they can post things on and then it stays there. I, I think about when I was in college and I'd walk down the hallway and I'd see the boards where people would post things. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really, really interesting. But I've also participated in a few webinars that they've used it this year and they just post a Padlet link in the conversation so you can pull it up. 
and then everyone can contribute to it. Mm -hmm. So whether you're on a laptop or a phone or whatever, there's a lot of control that's integrated with it as well for students. Um, so you can lock a board down that only certain people can access. There is a profanity filter if you feel that it's needed, um, but you can also insert pictures and, and emojis and GIFs, which is fun for kids. So it's a really nice tool, but then it also captures it in a permanent way that you can go back and visit it. So that's that's been really fun um, to, to explore and play with that. I will say that there is a fee associated with it. I think you get three Padlets free and then you have to pay for an account beyond that. So it is something to to think about if you're worried about financials right now. Yeah. I know, and somebody else I think mentioned Kahoot, which, I, which I've used in person with teenagers because um, they all love it. And that's, so every year we, when we plan the summit, we have a group of teens who help us to plan um, that event and they always want to do Kahoot as part of that. And so, um, so it, I know we, we will absolutely integrate that into um, our virtual uh, teen, teen ego experience. Um, but it's kind of like a, a quiz show type thing. You can do different trivia and things with it. And, um, and so that's how, how we've used it in the past. I know we are almost out of time um, and I, I might ask a question that no one has an answer to, but we might all be thinking is evaluation of these virtual programs and how do we do that? Of we you know, of course we can use SurveyMonkey and send a link to the teachers, but uh, has anyone found a really good way to, to evaluate the students and get their feedback or anything like that that they'd be willing to share? You've asked a tough question. <laughs> well, and I know it's something it, we are very lucky at my zoo. We actually have an evaluation department. So we have people that are committed to that. I realize not every organization has that, but it's something we've been wrestling with um, since, I, like I said, we've been doing distance learning since 2008. So this has been a 12 year journey for us and we still don't have a good answer. So I would love to know what is and isn't working. Um, but I think based on the, the silence that we're all still wrestling with this question. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard one because I think one of the um, discussions that I had with another group of people the other day about planning, um, about planning virtual summits was that um, I, I think the go-to for um, for non-educators a lot of times is to say how many people participated, and and that's the immediate evaluation piece, right? Um, but we were talking about the fact that that especially when you're talking about something like like an eco summit or or an event even like this today, um, the people who are here are really invested. They want to be a part of that conversation and want to be a piece of it. And so um, there's a, in some ways a higher commitment level when people participate in something like this than there might be if I have. Um, a bunch of schools come for, for an event, right? Because the teacher has kind of decided and brought them along for that. And that's how you get the big numbers. And so um, so we were talking a little bit about how 20 te independent teenagers deciding they want to sign in is is in some ways more powerful than 200 kids that a teacher brought to the zoo, you know? So trying to figure out how do you evaluate that engagement and what people really do beyond that moment that you're connected, I think is is a huge challenge for all of us. I think that it's an excellent question and I think that we're all going to be grappling with it, but I think that it's almost like the question for the next step for, for most of us. So you're, I think, are they very, very relevant that we need to start thinking about it. We can do zooming till we blew in the face sort of thing, but what is it really achieving? But at this stage, I think most of us are just trying to get to the, the zooming stage. So we will work on that. And uh, Kim, you can help us lead the way on the evaluation, please. We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Tatiana asked, can't polls a few days after the event be an answer or a few days after the virtual session? And I think that's, that's definitely part of it. Um, 
I know my frustration and Becky kind of alluded to this, not frustration, but, you know, if you have a teacher who's dragging the students along and you might get the teacher's input, but I'd really like to know what the students think. I know one time we actually did get evaluation from a student about a program called Grossology, where we talk about slime and owl pellets and poop and stuff like that. And the, the children were just completely disgusted. <laughs> so the teacher had great feedback and wonderful um, things to say, but the students were not as impressed as, as she was. So it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's getting into those, those deeper kind of, what do the students think or what do the kids think and not the parents? And um, yeah, it, so you think reaching them is definitely a challenge, but yeah, I think survey monkey or polls or whatever, as much as we can, some evaluation is better than no evaluation for sure. And Becky, we are like about out of time. Oh, Cheryl, sure. it seems like an embedded evaluation might be the way to go here because um, you're asking people to uh, climb a, another barrier if you're asking them to go to another site, to another link and spend more of their time. But if you can find a way to embed the evaluation, you not only, you have the benefit of getting, understanding what the students are, are learning, what they're thinking, what they're doing um, without, and, and, you know, without just being the teacher's feedback or but without being just a satisfaction survey, which, you know, they're pretty useless or, um, or, or, you know, putting in that extra barrier. So think embedded evaluation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a point on that too is perhaps this is a way for us to start thinking more creatively about all of our evaluations. Mm -hmm. We've been doing surveys forever. Maybe it's time to think out the box and maybe this time can help us to actually think more creatively. Uh, there must be fun, more fun ways to do evaluation and, and how do we grapple with that? How about, hi, this is Heather Rivera from the El Paso Zoo. Um, what about, um, I know sometimes we've gotten feedback, but fun feedback from some of the kids, like they have to draw a picture or do a, a, a cute assignment, but can can we turn that into evaluation? Maybe make that part of our program, you know, something that would be fun. And, and it might not, you know, even if it's gross, like I, I really like the grossology program, but obviously, <laughs> you know, I would have loved to have done something like that. But yeah, we don't know what the kids are thinking, but um, maybe maybe that's something we can do. I, I'm thinking of maybe just talking to my, my fellow educators and telling them, you know, maybe, that's the way we get a, a child's evaluation is having it be part of their, like, I guess the post program, you know, post and have the teacher, you know, maybe the teacher knows in advance that we're going to have that as a post and it'll be the evaluation, you know, if, even if they draw a picture and say it was a terrible program, whatever, you know, but I, I don't know, you know, I, I like the idea of, of getting the feedback from the kids because honestly, I don't think in a way you never, you, you, you try to look at their face of their, of their video, if their, you know, if their camera is on. Um, but other than that, you know, we really don't consider their feelings, I guess. It's what the teachers think and, and what really matters should, it should be the kids, right? <laughs> what well, a great idea. I think I got it from someone at Zoos Victoria. Um, but it's kind of incorporating games, but that are secret evaluation. So you do the program, maybe it's about three different conservation programs, and then you give the kids, you know, five imaginary dollars, and then they can donate it to the conservation center of their choice. So things like that, too. I think, um, you know, if, if they don't know it's evaluation, it's sneaky evaluation <laughs> um, can help. But then, of course, you have to interpret like, oh, I have five dollars, and maybe they just voted for the tiger because the tiger's their favorite animal, you know, who knows. And that's about the design of the evaluation. <laughs> yeah. So make sure you're measuring what you intend to measure and not, you know, other things, you know, make sure that the indicators are, are closely aligned with what your, what your goals are. Wonderful. So we are right at our time. <laughs> So um, we are now kind of out of time for our session. We do have another one that will be starting in, I have to do the time conversion. Um, <laughs> I believe it starts in two hours. 
And that will be our session um, that will be presented in, in Spanish and Portuguese. So thank you all for joining. Happy IZE day. Um, we are going to go ahead and, and close down this Zoom session just so it's not sitting open for several hours, but um, the link that you got to access this session will also get you into the other session. Um, Umberto, you are presenting at the next session. Yeah, so we will see him later <laughs> again. Um, and we will have the recordings I'm of these sessions posted. Here. <laughs> oh yeah, you are good. We can see and hear you. So you are set up. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for joining. Enjoy your can break you and hopefully we'll see you can later. You a window open just for a, a few minutes so we can capture the chat. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for a great session. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for everyone's great ideas. <laughs>